You're listening to That Gets My Goat on the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Hey, everybody. Hi ho. Oh, sorry. That was your line. That's my line. <laughs> Hi ho. Big Inklovich here. Welcome to That Gets My Goat. Here in the studio. Quote unquote. With me is Rish Outfield. Okay, me. <laughs> And also, we are continuing on our series of uh, podcasts involving our special guest, Abby Hilton. I've been living in the panic room here at the Dune Steve. They take me out every once in a while, let me eat something, some cat food. or <laughs> No, anyway, yes, I'm, I'm still here. Hi. Something you said in the last episode reminded me of something I wanted to talk to you about. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You said that somebody discovered something that, they, that didn't agree with them in one of your writings, and they had to throw their hands in the air and say, I'm done with her and all of her work. And that really reminds me, there's, there's this uh, author, Dan Pillsbury, he's one of my uh, favorite authors, and he's written, well, I, I won't even list the, the books, and I'm a big fan, I've been reading him for years, and... Recently, he came out with this, these, these crazy, well, not crazy, he's entitled to his opinion. He's, he's political statements. He really doesn't like white people. And he said that, but he's, he's gone as far as to say that unless it's a mixed race couple, white people should only be allowed to have one child. And that all white male children should have their pinky fingers cut off so that they will have a disadvantage because for so long whites have had an advantage that was unfair. I mean, just these, these, these things that he said. Crazy. And a friend of mine said, you can't still like this guy's work when you've heard what this guy is like in real life. I, I, I know you've loved his books, but you can't love him anymore. And I thought about it because I didn't know if she was right or not. This guy's writing is the same as it was a year ago. Mm -hmm. But... You know, I do feel like, ooh, shoot, maybe I can't talk about Dan Pillsbury in mixed conversation or they'll think that I believe what he believes. So can we talk about this, 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 sure. th apply it to actual authors and the statements that they have made? I immediately thought of an author that... Oh, okay, that yeah, I, you know what I'm talking that about. That I loved and that I read some of his essays that were egregiously prejudiced and horrific. And I have a really hard time enjoying his work now and... It makes me sad because, like you said, it's the same work. I feel like I should be able to separate him from his work. But I really wish he, that he would have kept his obnoxious views to himself because it's been several years since I've read any of this person's books. And I can't help seeing it now in his writing. Before, I could be like, it was ambiguous enough that I could be like, well, who knows what he really thinks. But, you know, now it's like, oh, well, now that's quite obvious that this is more of that that coming out. And people do change over time, so you can like look at earlier work and sort of like see progression of some of them, these kind of ideas sort of calcifying maybe in this person's mind. You can look at early, early work and be like, he clearly didn't think that back then. But yeah, I mean, that's that's frustrating. I don't know what to... Nobody has ever said, oh, now that I know what Abby thinks personally, I can't enjoy her work. I haven't gotten that sort of thing. It's been more like, you know, they expect me to redeem Silvio by making him straight and God-fearing in the terms of that world. And because that's not how he is redeemed, they get very angry and they feel like, bef you know, they weren't sure before, but now they're quite sure that that's not how the, you know, the character is going to become a better person. And, you know, it's, it's that sort of thing. So, yeah, it makes me sad that some people, I have a hard time enjoying their work once I know some things about them in real life. My turn. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing that I was actually just talking with somebody that listens to the show and they were mentioning our policy that we've had since the beginning of we don't try not to anyways. <laughs> I'm sure here and there something pops up, but we almost 100% try to avoid politics and religion because both of those are fairly divisive topics and our show's not about either of those things. I mean, I can understand you have a political show, yeah. you're going to speak your political mind, and the people that agree with your political 
attitudes are going to be the people that listen to your show, but our show is not about politics. It's not about religion. We don't talk about either of those things because the people that listen to our show are here to listen to good stories and comic book banter or whatever. And so we don't talk about those things because if we were, there's going to be those people who are listening to it and then they're finally like, oh, I don't know if I can like these guys anymore because they like Barack Obama or they like Mitt Romney or they like whatever. They're Hinduists or, you know, whatever it is. A communist. Right. You never know what it is that the person's going to be like, oh, forget it. I didn't know these stories were narrated by communists. And they'll just quit and stop listening to the show. And there's no reason for that to happen because it's not part of our show. And so I would try to avoid it. And yeah, there are authors who have gone out there and thrown that to the wind. And they're like, hey, I'm telling you all my political opinions. And now the people that read their stories are the people that agree with their political opinions. And those that didn't agree are finally like, you know, I I can't respect this guy anymore. And so I'm not going to read his stories anymore. And, you know, I, I don't know. It seems really like a bad move to make when you're trying to establish a writing career is to go out and put your political opinion, you know, putting story elements like, you know, Abby's talking about here is I think a a pretty different thing. Things are going to happen. Characters do things because they're characters. They're not you. Some people have a hard time separating character with author. And so they'll boycott somebody because their character did this. You know, I know authors that are super Christian, you know, believe in it's got to be this way. The authors that believe homosexuality is wrong and still have homosexual characters in their works. And so characters aren't authors. And hopefully people can tell the difference and can separate that. But obviously there are people that cannot, as we've uh, given examples of in this whole thing. Well, I think that that's partially just a function of not being entertained. You know, if, I, if I'm making them feel guilty, I'm not entertaining them. And they do read to be entertained. But yeah, I'm not quite sure why. No, I mean, I guess I do understand why authors put stuff like that out there because they feel like they're being brave. They feel like they're being themselves or whatever. And maybe it's cowardly to hide behind your fiction. But for the most part, I kind of feel like I say what I need to say with my stories. I don't feel the need to... I, I don't Facebook or tweet about my political beliefs or don't feel the need to do that. I guess if I was writing uh, work that was like... If I was writing nonfiction, that would be completely different. And you guys kind of have a you guys kind of walk the line there because your 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 dialogue is nonfiction, so you do have to eliminate an element of your personal taste and feelings. No, it's all to com- fictitious. <laughs> to completely avoid that on your podcast, that's a little bit different. There is actually no Rish Outfield nor Big Anklevich. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> Did we stray far from your your point, Rish? No, I just I didn't know what the answer was. I'd still like to know if she's right. You can't still like Dan Pillsbury's books when you know that he hates you, when you know what he's like. And as she said it with such authority, like, you know, this is black and white. This is the truth. And so it was said with some so much authority that I thought maybe she's right maybe I'm wrong maybe in a way I mean to keep reading the author is a great big fuck you especially if you go and buy their books and use bookstores and make sure you don't give them any money <laughs> if they're entertaining you then you're still getting what you want out of them you don't have to subscribe to their beliefs I think it just depends on the person though I mean ultimately you tend to read fiction for entertainment. I mean, there, there is fiction that I read that's not for entertainment. I sometimes read classics that I don't like because I want a background in what I'm writing. There's all kinds of reasons to read something. But if you're reading it for entertainment and you're not entertained because the author's repugnant views keep echoing in your head, then, yeah, you're probably going to stop reading. I don't know. I mean, I think it depends on you. Can you still enjoy this person's work? You tell me. Your oh, you me. actually want an answer yeah. on that? Well, I loved that book, you know, when I was 12 years old or whatever the deal is. I'm not going to erase that memory and and block it out and say, you know, yeah. little did that 12-year-old idiot know. Well, the writer I'm talking about is a fantastic writer. I mean, <laughs> phenomenal. And I have seen this person speak. He's an incredibly charismatic person. Super charismatic. Convince you the sky is green. 
So, you know, this is like a cult leader level, per, I think, when I met him, I thought so. But yeah, I think he's a very uh, damaged individual who has horrible beliefs that are only getting more calcified as he gets older. But I, I mean, I still, the early books that I read of his are still on my favorite books list. I learned things from his writing. I think that he's still better than me at many things. So why not keep learning from this guy? Okay, well, th- th- that's the answer yeah. I wanted to hear. Oh, I-, I wanted an answer, and so... You're allowed to keep liking their work. I am Thank you. <laughs> inclined to buy this person's work at used bookstores because I was angry enough not to want to give him any money. But He's actually, speaking of the Pillsbury Doughboy, and just the, it's just the ingredients on the back of the oh, tube okay, okay. that he liked reading so much. Rich doesn't actually read books. He's no. just putting this on as a front for all you to appear more intelligent in part of this conversation. And the true irony of this is that the Pillsbury Doughboy is white, <laughs> which is also the irony of the author I am talking about. And I won't say any more about that. <laughs> Okay, well then, then that I will go my way and and continue to That's what I think. like and appreciate and, and 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 look back fondly. Well, you feel like his newer stuff is harder for you to enjoy. Do you feel that like this person changed over time? Because everyone does. Like nobody. I mean, when he wrote those early books, I promise you, he wasn't the person he was by the time he wrote those essays or whatever, or, or, or Facebook posts or whatever it is you're talking about. Yeah, the the old stuff was better, oh. uh, and it was different, but. I don't know. More concise and less bloated. Yeah, sure. I mean, that, the, the, the dough had risen less. Uh, anyhow, I, oh, okay. So, uh, thank you for uh, for making me feel like I'm I'm not a sinner for. Or, sorry, sinner is a bad word. Okay. Anyway, we've run out of time for that one. Oh, Let's sorry. let let me say goodbye. Go. Goodbye. Oh, hey, so thank you. So this is a shorter one than the last one, and uh, thank you. Uh, and once again, I've been Rochelle Field. You're I, welcome. I think that's what she said to you. <laughs> it's been a short one, so thank you. Listen, yes, I've short, said that before. Shorter one than the last one. Do I have to go back to the panic room and the cat food? That's right. Get back down there. We'll bring you back up next week when we're ready for more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds ominous. <laughs> That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons non-commercial 3.0 license. You've got to be kidding me.